And dear God, I remember laying in my office floor, literally holding on to the legs of the furniture to keep from running away from God. I remember it. God was trying to get me to submit to Dave about something. I was just like... my flesh was hurting and screaming and I just thought I cannot do this I cannot do this <laughs> and I knew I had a call on my life and God had told me don't think your ministry is going to grow if you don't start treating your husband with respect <laughs> I mean I'd already rebuked every devil that could be rebuked and there was nothing left to do but obey God and I remember holding on to the legs of my, my furniture. God! Finally. All right. Okay, God, give me grace. I can do this. Go out where he's at. Honey, I'm sorry. It was all my fault. I believe you're right. Please forgive me. And inside, I'm still hearing this. And part of being obedient to God is to submit to the earthly authority that God puts you under. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, if you're going to kill something, you usually got to have a few tools. And one of the things that God uses to kill the flesh is people who tell us to do things we don't want to do. And they actually have the authority to make us do it. And oh man, is that a flesh buster. Come on now. And I told you this morning when I got on the floor and carried on, how trying to learn how to submit to my husband was one of the hardest things that I ever did in my life, not because he was hard to get along with, but because I was rebellious. And I didn't want anybody telling me anything. It didn't matter to me if it was right, wrong, or indifferent. I just didn't want to be bossed around. I'd been mistreated by a man in my childhood. My father sexually abused me, and he was very mean and manipulative and controlling. And I made a covenant with myself. When I get out of here, nobody is ever going to tell me what to do again. And I promised myself that for years. And let me tell you, when I finally saw that was not the will of God, there were some things in this woman's flesh that had to be broken. And as I said this morning, I can remember hurting so bad over simple little things, little things that Dave would ask me to do or not to do. And I would just go wild. You know what? The more rebellion you have in your flesh, the wilder you're going to act. I mean, I can remember having a three-day fit over a bathroom towel. <laughs> and I had the call of God on my life, and I was already teaching a home Bible study. <laughs> and God had called me to preach the gospel to the world. I, I had a seed of it in my spirit. But you know what? What was in me could not get out unless the flesh was broken. I had an embryo of greatness in me, but I was never going to see it manifested as long as I was going to throw three-day fits over a bathroom towel. Is anybody home today? I did not want to be told what to do. My husband was an engineer before he came into ministry, and he just likes to engineer everything, including me. 
I mean, he just thinks of things that I would not even think of. And, and really, they're good things or things that will keep me safe, but I just don't. Just like... <laughs> like he'll tell me, oh, don't get out of the bathtub like that. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, when you're not home, I take a bath. <laughs> and I'm still alive. I mean, his heart is right. He's just got that protective thing in him that a man really should have over his wife. But because of what I had in me, I didn't take it as him loving me. I took it as him just trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> and I had one of those mornings, this has been many years ago, but I had one of those mornings where I just... Okay, God, I just really want to have my coffee this morning and just be left alone. Oh, but oh no. You just better count on it when you feel like that. <laughs> Man. So I started to, I got, I got in the, the shower and I, I had thrown my towel on the toilet seat. Toilets over there, showers over here. And Dave had not put up a towel rack yet that I had been asking him to put up like forever. <laughs> and so I couldn't hang the towel on the shower door because there was no rack on the door. So I put it on the toilet seat. Got in the shower. Got out, stepped on the floor. Drip, 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 drip. Got my towel. Dave saw me. Always says, you shouldn't put your towel there. I mean, I did not even hear what he said. Because the attitude that is in us will always come out. I mean, and see, that was just my automatic response. Well, what is wrong with me putting my towel there? Well, because you're dripping water on the floor. I said, well, it is the bathroom. And not only that, if you would have put the towel rack on the door, like I've asked you to a million times, then there wouldn't be a problem. You see, right away, when we're rebellious, it's not our fault, and don't try to tell us it is because it's your fault. Well, I just got mad, and he went on about his business, and I'm moaning to God, well, for crying out loud, you can't even take a shower in peace. I just, just wanted to have one cup of coffee and just be left alone, and it, there's just no end to it. it just, he's always got to try to tell me what to do. Always got to tell me what to do. Well, God, I just don't think I can stand this anymore. Now, keeping in mind, I had a call on my life to reach the world. <laughs> and I had a little ministry. And can I tell you what? If I would have stayed in that condition, I would still have a little ministry. And so many people are praying for their ministries to grow and their finances to grow. And God has asked you to do something that involves you dying to self and your, your flesh being crucified and you haven't gotten around to doing what God has said yet. Come on now. We're preaching good tonight. And I remember one morning when I was praying for my ministry to grow. And man, I had been to the intercessory prayer seminar. I had been to the, to the casting out devil seminar. I had been to the spiritual warfare seminar. And I was after it. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I'm a child of God. And I command this ministry to grow. You have no authority over me, Satan, right now, in Jesus' name, grow! <laughs> and I heard the Spirit of God say to me, just, just as calm as I'm speaking to you right now, he said, now, Joyce, 
I have told you what you need to do concerning your husband. And if you don't do it, then there's not one other thing that I can do about any kind of growth in your ministry. Silence. I mean, I wanted to talk about it and negotiate. <laughs> See if we could come up with a less painful plan. But let me tell you something, when God's finished with it, here comes those pruning shears. Whack! And all you're left with is... Ah! <laughs> I began to realize that we can we can control ourselves. Please get this today. You can control yourself if you want to strong enough. Because there's not one of us who acts up or acts bad in certain places and with certain people. Let's take the issue of God trying to teach me how to be submissive to my husband and, and how to talk to him properly and not have a bad attitude. Well, I would say, well, you know, I just have such a problem, God, with male authority because I was abused by several men in my life and I don't want to be this way, God, but I just can't seem to help it. And the Lord said to me one day, he said, you know, if you would show your husband one half the respect that you show your pastor. <laughs> Wives, be subject. Be submissive and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. Now, all the men like that, right? Right now you're thinking, yes, adapt, <laughs> submit. I've been trying to tell you all along that my way is right. But you see, this thing is two-sided. I mean, this has come so clear to me. You know, it's interesting. God gave this to my husband months ago. Dave sat me down one morning and he'd gotten a revelation out of Ephesians. And you know, sometimes when one person gets a revelation, no matter how much you tell it to somebody else, they don't get it. You know, Dave told me all this and he was all excited about what God had shown him. And I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, but now I've got it. He said, this is it. The perfect union in marriage is for a man to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And see, we're not talking about a man loving his wife like the guy next door loves his wife. We're talking about a man loving his wife as Christ loved the church. And obviously it's going to take some time to expound on that. And we're talking about a woman's job then is to submit and adapt to her husband. And the other major thing the Bible says is the woman's function is to respect and reverence her husband. Now you all ought to write those two things down somewhere. The man's job is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And the woman's job is to submit to her husband and respect him. If both parties will do their part, you will have a glorious relationship. The problem we get into is sometimes not both parties are willing, and so then we get a standoff. Well, I won't if you don't. And they say, well, I'm not going to if you don't. And so we just have a royal mess. Well, somebody needs to start somewhere, and I want to encourage you this weekend. I hope that both partners are going to be willing to start and do exactly what God says. And I believe that's the way it's going to turn out. But even if you find that one of you is more willing than the other one, you do it as a service to the Lord. It's got to start somewhere. What's going on now is not working, that's for sure. And so we've got to start somewhere making the changes. So wives are to be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. There's nobody probably that's any better qualified than I am, or at least I'm as qualified as lots of other people would be, to stand and try to teach women how to submit and adapt. Because I was your least likely person to ever want to adapt to anything. I wanted everything and everybody to adapt to me. And when I first began to see that word in the Bible that a wife was to adapt to her own husband, it would literally just give me the creeps. I mean, I just thought, adapt. You know, it's amazing how miserable we can make ourselves because we will not adapt to some simple little thing that somebody's asking us to do. 
But because of pride and rebellion, we are going to stand our ground and we are going to have it our way. And what happens is it just makes everybody miserable. I mentioned to you that for three years, I fought with Dave over his golf. We fought and we fought and we fought and we fought. I was determined that he was not going to play. And he was determined that he was. And you know, when you get one determined that you're not and one determined that you are, you got a problem. And I'll be sharing some more things with you about that later on in some other lessons, but I made myself miserable for three years and I made him miserable. And folks, I want to tell you something. If each of you are miserable, your children are miserable. And much of the rebellion that we see in teenagers today is caused because of the strife between the parents. Don't think you can fight all the time in the house and it not affect your children. It most certainly does affect them. I watched my kids over the years that they were growing up. Any time that Dave and I would get in a fight, they'd get upset and go to the rooms and cry. It unsettles a child when they see their parents fight. They don't understand that. Many times they think it's their fault. It produces all kinds of insecurity and fear in children when their parents fight all the time. And so Dave and I were fighting over the golf and here we had three little kids running around all the time and I was mad and pouting all the time and Dave was not going to quit and I was determined that he was. And the more I harped, the more he played. And I began to see these scriptures in the Bible that a woman should adapt to her husband and I just thought, well, I'll die first. I can't do it. <laughs> I mean, have you ever had such a rebellion in your flesh that you honest to God thought if you had to give in you would die? Lift up your hand if you had. I mean, you just, you just felt like, well, I just can't. That is all. I cannot. It will kill me if I have to humble myself and do what you want me to. Well, folks, on the other hand, I'd like to tell you that the devil will probably kill you if you don't. <laughs> do it God's way. And you know, one night, you know, if you're going to play golf and be a good golfer, then you've got to practice all the time. And so not only did he play golf, but he practiced during the week too. And so I'd be home with the kids all day by myself, and Dave would come home and you know, we'd have dinner, and I mean, he didn't do this every night, but he'd get out the golf clubs, and you know, he'd go out to the driving range to hit golf balls. I didn't understand all of that. None of that made any sense to me. And we only had one car, and I'd be home all week with the kids, and every other person that lived in the apartment complex we lived in was about 75 years old and older. And I listened to the same war stories over and over and over and over, you know. And see, the Bible says that a man is to dwell with his wife with understanding. And a lot of times men don't have understanding. You don't understand, men, what it's like to be home with the kids all day long, day in and day out. You are out with adult, normal people. They don't all just slobber and go... I mean, you actually... I mean, you don't know what it was like for me just to get out and talk to somebody that was an adult. And so it's very important that you do things together and you dwell with each other with understanding. Now, I was so hard to get along then, uh, hard to get along with at that time, that Dave probably went a lot more than what he would have just to get away from me. How many of you know that the Bible says that to live with a nagging woman is worse than living in a corner of an attic under a tin roof with the rain dropping on it? That's what it says in Proverbs. To live with a nagging woman is worse. Uh-huh. Should I ask how many nagging women we got here this weekend? She's not one. Well, that's good. That it's worse to live with a nagging woman than it is to live in a corner of an attic under a tin roof with rain continually dropping on it. And so Dave always invited me to go. See, it wasn't the issue that he was just taking off without me. He would invite me to go, but I was too bullheaded to do it. Because I didn't want to do that. And I didn't think he ought to be doing that. And I was not giving in. So for three years I suffered. Made him miserable, made me miserable. Made our marriage miserable, made our kids miserable. At least two, three times a week I'd get mad over that golf. I mean, I got to the point where I hated it. I mean, hated it. You ever gone through something like that? One of your marriage mate was doing something, you got to the point where you hated it. And you know, finally one night he left and he went out to the driving range. And I don't, I don't even remember how I got there now. Maybe we had two cars by then, although I don't... Maybe he went out with somebody else. Maybe somebody else picked him up and he went out. And I was sitting there pouting and crying and unhappy with our three kids. And here he's out at the driving range in the sunshine having a good time. And somehow, by the mercy of God, God gave me the grace to swallow my pride. And I put those three kids in the car. And I drove out to that driving range and I got them out of the car. And we went and we stood in front of Dave. I said, all right, I give up. Here I am. 
teach me to play golf. Now, you know, when, how many of you know it's hard to give in? It took me three years to give in. But you know the whole point I want to make is that whole time I was the one that was miserable. Now, I made him miserable too, but I suffered unbearably. And see, when, when you demand having your own way, you're really the one that ends up suffering more than anybody else. Now, what for? What sense does that make? And you know, really, you need something to do to have some kind of entertainment or hobby anyway. And I learned to play golf with Dave, and, and it's something we still enjoy. Don't be bullheaded. Ladies, turn to your husbands and say, I'm not going to be bullheaded anymore. And don't mutter when you say it either. <laughs> Speak in this, yeah, this guy over here says louder, honey, louder. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. I know it was hard, but maybe if we try it again, it won't be quite as bad. Ladies, turn to your husbands and say, I'm not going to be bullheaded anymore. <laughs> All right, men say good. <laughs> oh, but you guys are going to get your turn. Don't. Don't think for one minute we're leaving you out of this. I just haven't gotten cranked up into full gear yet on the men. We'll... I'm, I'm giving the men at least a couple of lessons to get comfortable. See, a lot of you guys don't know me, and I've got to get you to like me a little bit first. I'm sure some of you guys thought, what in the world am I going to this thing for? But I tell you what, God's got purposes that ye know not of. <laughs> Watchman Nee's got a book about this thick, and if you think it's hard to listen to me, you ought to try him for a while. He's got a book about that thick on spiritual authority. And it'll rock your world about the way things should be compared to the way things are in our society today. And I don't care if it is the 21st century, God doesn't like it. He wants us to learn how to have a right godly, submissive attitude toward authority. You ain't not going to like this message. I can tell you that. But it will produce fruit, fruit, fruit in your life. First of all, you're never going to have peace if you're rebellious. Because everywhere you go, somebody's going to be telling you to do something you don't want to do. But Watchman Nee said, the first job that we have as believers Anytime we walk into a room is to look around and see who's in authority and make a decision to come under that authority. Now, when I'm up here, I'm in authority. But when I come down from here, I'm his wife. He has to be the head of our home. That doesn't mean I don't have opinions. That doesn't mean that we don't share authority, that we don't share ideas. But I have to have an attitude of respect toward him. And I might as well just say this, I think one of the reasons why God is not able to use more women than what he does, and he's using a lot, but I think there's a lot more that he could use if they would understand that just because God gives them a platform doesn't mean that they now do not have to come under any other authority that God has established in the home. And I'm preaching good whether you like it or not. You know, people always want to know, you know, why I'm so successful, why I'm so successful. Well, first of all, it's God and He gets all the glory. But I can tell you one thing, I wouldn't be successful if I was smart-mouthing my husband all the time at home. Ooh, I bet you we won't sell many of these CDs. Amen. A Sunday in our house was just totally and completely ridiculous. I would have my Bible study on Tuesdays, and Dave would work all week, and I'd spend the week getting mad at the kids, trying to get calmed down, getting mad at Dave, trying to get calmed down, getting upset about this, trying to calm down. If, you know, we had anything that happened that took some of our money that I wasn't planning, I'd get upset, try to get calmed down. And then on Saturday, Dave would play golf, and that would make me mad. And then on Sunday, we'd go to church, and I would sit in church and begin to think, now, when we go home, if he gets in front of that television again, and if he starts with the football, I am going to be so upset. See, I already had myself 
mentally prepared for a disaster. And some of you need to be careful that you're not sitting now about 2.30 in the meeting, you know it's not going to be long, you're going to be going home, and you want to be careful that you're not already thinking, when I get home, <laughs> if that house is in a mess, and if they have not done what I told them to do, there is going to be war. Now that is the worst thing that you can do is come to something like this and then go home and let the enemy use something like that to steal from you everything that you got. So get a mindset before you go. So when I would get mad at Dave, we'd go home and, you know, of course, when we got to church, everything was lovely. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. So good to be here. Hallelujah. I surrender all. I surrender all. Yay! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Get in the car and start fighting. Come on, you're laughing because you've been there, done that. Now. So I'd go home and I'd fix something to eat. David would go get in front of the TV. The kids would go out and play. And I had all the mess in the house. And of course, here we'd go. I do all the work right here. Inside me. I do all the work. It's always me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody tries to make sure that I get taken care of or that I get entertained. So for some reason, and I don't know if you do this or not, but when I would get mad, I would work. And so... And I, well, I know now why I did it, but I didn't know then. I did it trying to make Dave feel guilty because he's, you know, he's all laying back there with the remote. And, you know, I walk through the room and having my little temper tantrum. everything and vacuuming and I mean I would vacuum loud like Rrr, you know dusting everything around him and I honestly remember one time going through that room and him saying honey if you're going to the kitchen would you maybe bring me an iced tea <laughs> well you have to understand what my soul was like then I was so full of rage but next Tuesday I'd have my Bible study of 25 people Telling them how they needed to live the life of faith and believe God. And then on, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, I would act like a crazy person again. Then on Sunday morning, we would go to church, praise the Lord, thank you Jesus, hallelujah. We bring the sacrifice of praise. And then Sunday, we would go back and do the same thing all over again. And I would get myself so worked up. And I would try everything trying to control Dave. Because people who are emotionally out of control use those emotions to manipulate people. Self-pity, anger, rage, all kinds of stupid stuff. So finally, I would just, I would be worn into a frazzle. I would be completely worn out.
out emotionally. How many of you know that a good fit wears you out emotionally? And so, for some reason, I like to finish my fit in the bathroom. It was way back in the back of the house, the last room in the house. The littlest room, the lowliest room, the loneliest room. And since I was already in such a pathetic mood, I wanted my surroundings. I mean, where's a better place to feel sorry for yourself than in the bathroom? So I would go to the bathroom. And I would start maybe somewhere like this. <laughs> longer I can put up with this. God, if you don't change Dave pretty soon, I just think I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> my God, you're going to change Dave. And so, you know, I'd cry and carry on. It was always Dave that needed to change. And then, you know, by the time some of the mascara was running down my face, I'd you know, look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> That's why we cry in the bathroom because there's a big mirror in there. And we already feel sorry for ourselves, and then when it gets really bad, we can look at ourselves and ramp it up to another level. <laughs> then I would always end up hugging the toilet. I don't, you know, I would end up with the... <laughs> now, I had one of, my, one of my greatest spiritual moments. This has only happened to me one time in my life, but I felt my spirit lift out of my body and hover like on the ceiling and I saw myself from a spiritual viewpoint. I saw what God was looking at. I heard the Holy Spirit say, you look ridiculous. You have a call on your life. I've called you to teach the word. I've called you to help people. And you got your head hanging in the toilet, bawling your eyes out because your husband is watching a football game. And I'm telling you what, had I not stopped hugging the toilet, I wouldn't be here today. That is great. Um, you are a great Bible teacher. You simplify everything. Would you please tell us submission? What is that and how does it work in your marriage? Because you are the boss. You are Joyce Meyer. <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm Joyce Meyer, the minister, the president of Joyce Meyer Ministries, when I'm in the pulpit or when I'm functioning in my professional role or my gifting. But the minute I step down from the pulpit, I'm Dave Meyer's wife, and I have the same responsibility that anybody else does. Submission doesn't mean I don't have a mind. It doesn't mean I don't have an opinion. It doesn't mean that Dave controls everything that goes on, but it's really all about, it's about respect. It's about honoring the God-ordained order. And Dave,
Dave and I agree on most things, but to be honest, if we really just don't agree about something, then we either leave it alone until we can come to a place of agreement, or if a decision absolutely has to be made, then I have to give way to his decision because he is the head of our home and ultimately the one that's going to be responsible. I've had to work hard on the submission thing. I know everyone wants to know that. Ephesians 525, we're in Ephesians. Let's look at verse 25. Sacrifice in marriage. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now that's the key thing that we're going to talk about this afternoon. See, Christ loved the church, but he didn't love the church selfishly. You know, men, if you want your wives to submit to your authority, one of the best ways to get her to do that is in all your decision making, have her interest in mind. Don't just make a decision based on your own self. and feel like, well, you've got to do what I want you to anyway because that's the wife's position. You have to have her best interest in mind. No marriage, and I want you to listen to this, no marriage is going to be even a mediocre marriage without sacrifice. You must understand that. Are you, being here will not do you one ounce of good. You are not going to be able to have your way all the time. Amen? Amen. Turn to your partner and tell each other, I understand that I am not going to be able to have my way all the time. <laughs> now look at him again and say, oh! <laughs> there has to be sacrifice if people are going to have a good marriage. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He gave himself up for her. Now, man, I'm not making this up. This is the Bible talking to you.
the men. The men. You know, I told Dave, we're sitting back there talking during your little groups that you were having. And I said, you know, Dave, really, in reality, I've heard all kinds of messages in the 12 years that I've really been in the Word about wives submitting to their husbands. But, you know, I don't really think the other side of that has been taught enough. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a woman and I'm the one doing the teaching. I don't really think there's been enough teaching about how a man should treat his wife. I've heard a lots of sermons about submit, 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 wives adapt, wives submit. And you know, then I'll hear a little bit about, well, men ought to love your wives. But you know, sometimes I don't think you guys know how to. And I don't mean that, you know, in a rude way. I think that basically we're all, in our natural state, just self-centered. And because the man is the head of the house, because he is the one that is the high priest of the home, he's the one making all the decisions, it gets very easy to get into this thinking that you're really much more important than anything else that's going on. And that's really not what the Bible says. You're not one iota better than your wife. It's just divine order. <laughs>
They stop thinking that those things are important. They stop giving compliments. They stop helping. They stop washing one another's feet. So Dave, I'm committed to you. I'm willing to do little things for you and help you in whatever way that you need help. You're my man. I love you. And Yes. Can I get a little reflexology here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way it is at home. You give them an inch and they take a mile, right? There you go. Oh, I got to oh, I got to dry them. He says, "Okay." This is going to be great on TV, isn't it? I'm telling you. Come on. Oh, get out of here. It's dry. Here, dry your own feet. <laughs> Come on, if you understand my message, give God praise.